Yes, another reviewer. Now, as I said in my last movie review, Kevin Smith has a great run of movies, but every third one he makes is either just plain bad or fairly lackluster. Well, I'd already named the next review I would do in that video, and I'm not talking about Geely 2. I'm talking about the 2010 film Cop Out, a buddy cop movie starring Bruce Willis and Tracy Morgan, written by Mark and Rob Cullen, and directed by Kevin Smith. As this film progresses, we're introduced to more characters and more branches of the plot that end up being related to each other, much like a hillbilly family tree. This is going to be painful, but I'll try to get you through it as quickly as possible. The first characters we're introduced to are Detective Jimmy Monroe, played by Bruce Willis, and Detective Paul Hodges, played by Tracy Morgan. They work with, and seem to have a rivalry with, another pair of detectives known as Hunsucker and Mangold, played by Kevin Pollock and Adam Brody, respectively. To move the plot along, we're introduced to our villain of this picture, Po' Boy, played by Guillermo Diaz. Next, we're introduced to Bruce Willis' supporting cast, which consists of his daughter Ava, his ex-wife Pam, and her new husband Roy, portrayed by Michelle Trachtenberg, Francie Swift, and Jason Lee. It wouldn't be fair to give Bruce Willis his own family element if Tracy Morgan doesn't also get one, so we're introduced to his wife Debbie, with the role being filled by Rashida Jones. There's only so many ways you can say played as. After another attempt to get the plot rolling, the main duo run into Sean William Scott, who plays Stifler. Uh, I mean Steve. No, I mean, uh, Dave. Steve Dave. Uh, same difference. Uh, finally, after you thought you met everyone in their locality, in an incredibly strange turn of events, I don't really understand, we meet Anna Del Le Requera, which I have no idea if I said that right, but she plays Gabriella. If you thought that was convoluted, I'm about to walk you through the plot. Now, I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible, but it's pretty convoluted, so buckle up. The main plot of this film is that Jimmy, Paul, Hunsaker, and Mangold are involved in an investigation to find a drug dealer who's looking to expand his business. Hunsaker and Mangold have apparently been in undercover on this case for a month, while Jimmy and Paul interrogate a cell phone shop owner who is participating in drug trafficking that get drugs from Juan Diaz, played by Corey Fernandez, before it gets moved to the next drop. When Jimmy and Paul stage a sting, it goes horribly wrong when the drug dealer notices Paul, dressed as a cell phone, getting a little too nosy out front, and starts a shootout, thus blowing Hunsaker and Mangold's undercover operation, and the main duo gets suspended without pay for a month. This is when the film branches off into separate subplots, the first being the introduction of Po' Boy, the main antagonist to the film and older brother of Juan Diaz. He is portrayed as religious, a baseball fanatic with a huge collection, tells terrible baseball-related puns, and tortures people he interrogates by chaining them up in a batting cage and hits baseballs at them. He has his cronies do the shooting when it comes to killing people and doesn't seem to be willing to do it himself, and in the beginning of the movie his motivations are made clear that he wants to expand his drug trade, but he also mentions a Mercedes with sentimental value that isn't entirely clear. The Mercedes gets stolen on its way to him, and this causes Po' Boy to have several of the people in his gang to be killed. It's impossible to have a buddy cop movie without having a subplot revolving around the personal lives of our buddy cops. So first, let's talk about Bruce Willis's character, Jimmy. Jimmy is plagued with the I'm a good cop, but my life is fucking terrible syndrome. His daughter is getting married, and he's promised to pay for it. The wedding will cost roughly $48,000, which he can't afford since he was suspended without pay. This introduces his ex-wife, who resents him and has no faith in him, and her second husband, Roy, who offers to pay for the wedding. Jimmy threatens Roy for even bringing that up, as it would humiliate him, but then Roy goes even further to say that Jimmy is a deadbeat and should kill himself. This is where Jimmy gets the brilliant idea to sell a 1952 Andy Pafko baseball card he kept in mint condition since he was a kid. It's worth roughly 80 grand. The shop he sells it to gets robbed while he's there, and the card is stolen from him by Dave, who's heavy into parkour and uses it to break into people's houses. He also steals Paul's gun that Jimmy was holding so his family didn't know he was suspended. The entire robbery happens while Paul is distracted on the phone with his wife, Debbie. They later find Dave, and after finding out about Po' Boy, turn him in. Paul's subplot centers around his relationship with his wife. 
It's established that he has issues with jealousy. When he finds an empty champagne bottle in the trash and bedsheets and lacy panties in the wash, he attributes this to her sleeping with their neighbor, Henry. After he confronts her and she explains that she was celebrating her own professional accomplishment with an account she had spent a lot of time on. Paul, finding this not good enough, puts a camera and a teddy bear and leaves it in their bedroom, where he catches footage of her with another man. At first he asks Jimmy to watch it, who says there's nothing on the camera due to how he and his own ex-wife split up, but Paul eventually ends up watching the camera and becomes distraught. Two of the subplots converge when it's discovered that Dave sold Paul's gun and Jimmy's card to Poe Boy, who, when confronted, tells them that if they want the card back, they have to find his Mercedes. They find it by running a sting on the most notorious car thief in the city. An 11-year-old boy. Who tells them where they can get it? Once that bit of nonsense is over with and they get the car, they're chased down by Juan Diaz and another goon. The other car ends up crashing into a freshly opened grave and Juan Diaz is dead. This is when another subplot pops up involving Hunsaker and Mangold. They're investigating the deaths of the drivers of the Mercedes that allowed to get it stolen. Paul's gun was used in their murder by Juan Diaz, making this particularly useless duo believe that Paul has gone dirty and try to let Jimmy know. After Jimmy tells them off, they suspect that he has gone dirty as well, so they seek to implicate the two of them by speaking to Poe Boy himself. The final part of the Mercedes subplot is Gabriella. Jimmy and Paul find her in the trunk shortly after the car chase and take her to a hotel for safety. They find out she was the mistress of the drug lord Poe Boy had kidnapped, but someone had turned her over to Poe Boy while she was trying to make her way across the U.S. border. This is when Hunsucker and Mango contact Jimmy and leaves Paul to watch Gabriella. She goes to take a shower, and while she's doing that, Paul watches the video again to find his wife had tricked him, as the man in the video was her gay cousin, Eric. When Jimmy returns, he shares the news as they both realize Gabriella escaped after she realized she's putting both Paul and Jimmy in danger and left behind a crucifix that turned out to be a USB drive with numbers and bank accounts for the drug lord Poe Boy had kidnapped. With Gabriella gone, Paul and Jimmy post Dave's bail so he can quickly break into Poe Boy's house during Juan Diaz's funeral and get the card back. Unfortunately, Dave is distracted because he's made friends with Paul, slips, hits his head off of a rock wall, and is presumed dead. Jimmy makes his way back into the house as the gang is on their way back. It turns out they found Gabriella and captured her. Of course they did. After sending most of Poe Boy's gang away, Jimmy and Paul infiltrate the house. Hunsucker and Mangold show up, and Hunsucker gets shot. After getting the approval that Mangold has been after the entire movie from his par partner, he calls for backup. Jimmy and Paul get into the house, and after taking out Poe Boy's cronies, shoot Poe Boy and save Gabriella. Paul then hands her over with the crucifix to actual on-duty police, and the captain commends them. They get to the body of Poe Boy to retrieve Jimmy's card to find that Paul had shot through the pocket it was in. The end of the film takes place at Ava's wedding. Pam asks Jimmy to let Roy give Ava away with him during the ceremony. We then find Paul tying up his subplot with his wife, where the two had made amends earlier off-screen. We then get to see the ceremony. When the priest asks who gives this bride away, Paul puts a gun to Roy's back and tells him not to move. Roy then tells Pam that just Jimmy should do it instead, and Jimmy and Paul share a bromant. The film was actually pretty decent. I mean, it was completely unremarkable and forgettable, but it was funny. Some of the comedy scenes went on a little too long, though. I mean, the strange motives of the antagonist got kind of confusing, and while I know Guillermo Diaz is much better than his acting in this would claim, Bruce Willis and Tracy Morgan were fun and believable as partners. I think I would consider Kevin Smith's every third movie curse lifted with this one. I mean, it may be because it's the third of the third, which cancelled it out. Um, I enjoyed the music. It felt like it was a callback to Beverly Hills Cop and other 80s cop movies that this film takes so many tropes from. Uh, the random cuts and the way they had so many plot threads that ended up tying together was overdone and I think completely unnecessary. The subplot for Paul was just a play on how easily distractible he was. Every time he was in a, a position where he should have been paying attention, he was calling his wife to check on her. And then again when his mind was on what he saw in the nanny cam that allowed Gabriella to escape. But that honestly would have happened anyway. 
And about the subplot, I mean, yeah, he confronted his wife about the champagne bottle, but what about the sheets and the panties and the wash and a load of their own? It was explained that she was with the neighbor and that it wasn't a big deal, but where did those items come in? They were never even brought up. It seemed like a red herring just to drive the believability of her infidelity, but it just makes you wonder. She acknowledges she found the cam, which is why her cousin was the one in on it, but that doesn't say she isn't cheating. She could have found it, shot the fake, then after Paul took it, was free to gallivant again. If it wasn't for that little thing, that little red herring that they threw in there, that subplot would have felt closed at the end of the movie. And on the subject of infidelity, Roy runs Jimmy through the ringer for not having to pay alimony to his ex-wife in the same breath as saying money is nothing to him as he makes it with no effort. It was established that Pam was sleeping with Roy before the divorce, so this shouldn't even have been a thought. Once the two split, Roy was supporting her, thus making it so she had access to a lot more money than Jimmy did. Now, about Dave. You kinda wanna like Dave, and you do like Dave, but then you get halfway through the scene with Dave and you don't like Dave anymore. Why do I keep referring to him as Dave and not using a pronoun? Because I want you to feel as annoyed by Dave as I was by Dave whenever Dave was on the screen. Oh, essentially, this whole movie was a bad cop rampage while a pair of decent but douchely misguided cops were tailing behind to take the credit. At first, Hunsucker and Mangold aren't that bad and seem to just be taking the brunt of shit from Jimmy and Paul. I mean, they even take it really well as they laugh along with half the jokes that they make. But as the movie progresses, they move from being competent at forensics, but just a little weird, to being mind-numbingly ignorant of the situation, and in one instance, incredibly cowardly. The great thing was it was Hunsucker and Mangold's investigation. They were the ones that were undercover with it for a month. Jimmy and Paul got involved due to Jimmy's personal motives. Not only that, but I get confused when they talk about the dead drug dealer. At first I thought they were referring to the cell phone shop owner, but it turns out they were referring to a drug lord that the po' boy had kidnapped and killed. I guess all this happened off screen? I, I really have no idea. If they would have spent more time on the main plot, and a little less on all the subplots, this would have been conveyed a little better. And how did Jimmy and Paul even get away with continuing police work during their suspension? Yeah, Mangold covered them by saying that they were backing up him and Hudsucker, but wouldn't that make them a huge liability towards the case? If Poboy weren't killed, wouldn't that be something that could be used against the police department if he saw a trial? They basically got commended for going vigilante, and if they were still considered policemen, then they were definitely committing police brutality. I mean, like I said, this movie's a good watch, and there are laughs to be had. There's just nothing new. It's all the buddy cop movie tropes you could find in the last 30 years balled into one. An interracial pairing of cops whose relationship is very few steps away from being romantic while being self-aware of it and going on a bit of a tear after being suspended to see that their own personal justice is done. Wait till this movie goes on Netflix or rent it and watch it once. That's really all you need. You'll forget about it almost directly after or the next day, but someone you know will make a stupid overused joke and you'll suddenly be reminded of this movie.